speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is episode number three. Today, we've got a special treat. We've got self-publishing guru expert. I'm sure you've heard of him. I've been following his work for many years, and that is Dan Pointer. And he is joining us from Santa Barbara today, and he will be sharing some great tips on how to self-publish your book. We'll be talking about the new electronic media, the Kindle, the iPad, etc. And I think you'll find this interview to be very valuable, a lot of resources here and a lot of good stuff. So we will be back with that in just a moment. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. The price, only $197. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. It's my pleasure to welcome Dan Pointer to the show. I've been following his work for many, many years, and he runs a group called Para Publishing. It's parapublishing.com. You have probably heard of Dan because he is the undisputed guru and the guy who has really revolutionized the self-publishing industry. Dan, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Oh, it's a great pleasure my part to be here. Thank you, Jason. So tell us what's going on in the industry. I mean, talk about a changing industry. I discovered you maybe 11 years ago when I published my first book. And I remember back then, these publishers didn't know where they were going. And they were they were concerned about protecting their turf and all of that. And, and nowadays, with the Kindle, the iPad, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, things are really just changing so quickly. Oh, these are exciting times, Jason. And what we see in the book publishing industry is uh, going at an accelerated rate of change. And the reason is they haven't changed the way, the big New York publishers haven't changed the way they're doing business since 1947. I was reading something that Seth Godin wrote this morning. He said since 1907. <laughs> so in other words, they're playing catch up at an accelerated pace and they're very resistant to change. You see, all the big publishers know how to do is have your book manufactured and they don't do that. They send it out to a printer, and then they send your book out to bookstores. That's all they know how to do. And we're going vertical today. I mean, just for example, Amazon wants you to publish with them. They'll be your publisher. They can be your printer. They can reproduce your audio. And, of course, they've got the big website and the distribution. They do the shipping, so they're very vertical. They take you right from the beginning, and they cover all the steps, whereas the big New York publishers only cover the two steps. And so there's something still to be said for having your book on that bookshelf in the store, isn't there? I mean... Oh, absolutely. And you can get your book on the bookstore. You simply use a distributor. I use National Book Network, the largest one, and my books are in all the bookstores. That's not a problem. Also, something we discussed before we went on the air is uh, in, in addition to the e-book, you do need a P-book, a printed book, because you need the printed... Well, people take you more seriously if you have a printed book. You see, if you have an e-book, they think, well, you wrote an article or something. But uh, if, you, if you did an e-book, people think it's nice. If you've done a, a printed book, oh, you're an author. And the word authority contains the word author, so you're an authority by definition. People hold books and, and authors in high esteem. So you have to have that printed book, and you have to send the printed book out for review. So bearing in mind that eyeballs have moved from print to online... That's why the newspapers and the magazines are downsizing, consolidating, going out of business. The advertisers have put all their money into online promotion. We have to promote our books online, but we don't spend money doing it. We send review copies to anybody who has a blog on our subject. We send review copies to anybody who's got a website on our subject, to anybody who contributes and answers questions on forums and listeners. These are the opinion molders. These are the thought leaders. These are the people that uh, make things happen, and people listen to them, and they do what they're told. So if you send them an e-book, a PDF, 
They'll look at it and say, oh, Jason wrote a book. Boom, it's gone. Right, right. You send them a printed book. They take it out of the bag. They look at the front cover. They look at the back. They look inside. And then they put it on their shelf. And it is still there communicating back, constantly reminding them. And these thought leaders, these opinion molders, then are recommending your book to the people that, well, down below them. That's definitely good advice. I'm just wondering, is there any easy way or systematic way to do that? For example, do you have a recommendation for a fulfillment service where they can hold a bunch of your books, you can click a link, say, send it to this guy, send it to that blogger, send it to that person in the media, or is it just stick them in in an envelope and send them off yourself? Well, I recommend that everybody handle their own fulfillment initially, just so that you learn it, and that way when you go to buy service, you know what you're getting for your money. And I will also say that I have never been overwhelmed. We all dream of going to the post office when I was the old days, you know, and having the postmaster say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. We have these mail sacks full of orders for you. That was the old days when we dealt with the post office. But I've never been overwhelmed because the orders come in spread out incrementally. However, yes, there are fulfillment services out there, and you want to make sure that you get a fulfillment service that is close to your printer so that you're not paying a lot of trucking fees. And those fulfillment services are listed in my book. You want to find one that uh, is in the fulfillment business of shipping books so they know how to do that. They're not doing all kinds of products. And there are a number of them that specialize in that, so they're listed in my book. So any more on the industry? There's just so much. I I just want to kind of get that backdrop established before we get into more of the details of how to publish, how to promote, etc. But you're definitely right about the P-book, the printed book, the good old printed copy, no question. I say, what's going on in the industry? The the brick-and-mortar bookstores are going out of business. There are about 1,000 to 1,100 independent stores left. 25 years ago, it was only independent stores. And uh, they've been going out of the business the rate of three per week for years now. Then we have the chain stores like Borders, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. They're in deep, deep trouble. They're going to go out of business. And the reason is these brick-and-mortar stores are downtown, and their location, location, location is where... The property is very expensive. They cannot compete with an online store that's got a warehouse out in the country. Look and see what people are doing. Uh, What's happening with people? They go into a Borders or Barnes & Noble. They look at a store. They pick up their iPhone. They click onto Amazon, and they check the price, and it's 30% cheaper, and they hit the buy button, and they walk out. So Borders, Barnes & Noble, the independent stores are showcasing books for Amazon. I mean, that's the with the stark truth of it. Right. They're just turning around and basically showcasing them for free, actually. So it's it's kind of a bad deal for the brick-and-mortar person. But Barnes & Noble, for example, do you think they have a good chance of sort of a comeback, if you will, with their e-book reader? I can't... What's that called? The Q or something? The Nook. The Nook, yeah. Well, they're a little late. They they got into the e-books about a year and a half ago. That's when they bought up FictionWise, which is a very good e-book distribution company. And then uh, this year they came came out with the Nook, and they're trying. But they're Probably gonna, well, they've already closed down all the Walden stores and all the Dalton stores, the ones that were smaller out in the suburbs, uh, and now they're just concentrating on the superstores. And uh, they're going to continue to run the numbers. They're business people, and they just might have to close those down because the future really is buying things online. I don't know about you, but I travel a lot, and I hardly ever go into a store of any kind. I just go buy things online, and somebody delivers it. I think that's definitely true of everything but clothing, and even clothing I buy online, too, a little bit, not as much, but no lines, massive selection, lower prices, and no sales tax. <laughs> so, Well, you know, you're absolutely right. Of course, there's a difference between the way the men shop for clothes and women shop for clothes. We find a pair of shoes we like, we go online, we order a couple extra pair, and we have them banked in our closet. <laughs> A woman would never do that. She's got to go try it on and and look at it. But I think for men, that's really the new way to shop. No question about it. So why would someone want to self-publish versus going to a publisher? That's sort of the retail side of the book industry. Are there some big self-publishing success stories that you want to share? Or what sort of constitutes even success in in the world of publishing with a publisher and self-publishing? Well, basically, unless a publisher's got some great connections and can sell four times the number of books you can, you don't want to go with a publisher. The big New York publishers are in serious trouble. Uh, New York publishing is both broken and broke. And, And I'll tell you, they're going to go out of business very quickly. And if you don't think they can go from the top to the bottom overnight, just remember General Motors. The big New York publishers, the six of them, are going to be replaced by Google, Amazon, Apple, and maybe uh, BarnesandNoble.com. They're going to be the new publishers, and it's going to happen very quickly. The big publishers, if they know what's going on at all, are scared to death. 
I mean, just for example, you publish with Kindle Book today, and Amazon gives you a royalty of, was it 70%? <laughs> Big publishers can't compete with that. I mean, just there's no way they can, can handle that. So the only time you want to go with a publisher is if you go with a medium-sized one. Let me give you some numbers. Six large publishers in New York, three to 400 medium-sized publishers, 86,000 self-publishers. Now, the medium-sized publishers and self-publishers specialize. They may just do travel books on islands in the South Pacific. I mean, very, very specific. So that means they're plugged into that market, and they're selling those books not just through bookstores, but if it's a travel book, it would be through travel books, um, travel stores, and they have deals with travel agencies, and they go to all the travel conventions and you know, they're on the travel websites, and, and they're all plugged in, all specifically. Well, now a medium-sized publisher is pretty good. So you want to go to a bookstore, go to Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, and look for books in your category, and find books as close to yours as possible, and see who publishes them. And if it's a medium-sized publisher, you can go to their website and check it out and see if things fit. That might be a good way to go. The uh, other choices, however, are um, the vanity presses, which are very bad, and self-publishing. And self-publishing just means you do it yourself. You're going to make more money. You're you're going to get the press sooner, and you're going to keep control of your work. Dan, can you distinguish for the listeners? I, I just don't want to let you go on before you just make one distinction, if you would. A lot of people don't understand what a vanity publisher is, and the other one they kind of don't understand sometimes is what a subsidy publisher is. Can you just explain those? Vanity subsidy is nearly the same thing, and it's really confusing. And, of course, these vanity presses call themselves self-publishing companies because they're trying to capitalize on a recognized term. The only self-publisher is the author. Nobody can be a self-publishing company unless it's the author. Now, the problem with these vanity presses is that they're very expensive. I had a lady come up to me recently with a book, and she said, can you help me sell this? And I looked at it, and it had the name of a vanity publisher on the back. I said, how much are these books costing you? She said, $11 each. I said, I'll bet you haven't sent out too many review copies. She said, I can't afford to send out review copies. Why would you pay $11 for something you could buy for less than two? I mean, when you're paying $11, you can't afford to give a bookstore a discount, so they're not going to carry it. Uh, you can't even afford to send them out for review copies because they're too expensive. And these, these vanity presses, they have boiler rooms full of people calling authors every day. They always have a deadline, and they just wear people down to get their money. Now, before you deal with anybody in the publishing industry, and for that matter, before you buy a car or have your house painted, do yourself a favor. Make a Google search that company name and the plus sign and scam, company name plus fraud, company name plus Better Business Bureau, company name plus ripoff. And if there are problems with a company, you're going to read about it. You know, I, I dealt with a, a plumbing company just recently, and I went online and checked them out, and there were no bad reports on them. You know, I put the company name plus fraud, no bad reports. Okay, they must be okay. But you, with, with these vanity presses, you'll read all kinds of horror stories. I mean, the people are really upset out there, and some have been sued, and, and, of course, that's why you do Company Name Plus Better Business Bureau. And if you know anybody else who's thinking about going, who, who's writing a book and thinking about going with one out for an, or another, tell them to do it. You'll be doing them a great, great favor. Yeah, they're just taking advantage of people appealing to their ego, no question about it. So people should self-publish. I definitely get the point of that, because even a, a legitimate publisher, I mean, they don't really offer any promotion, do they? No, publishers don't promote books. As a matter of fact, they, the big publishers won't even take you on unless you already have a following. They're only publishing celebrities, people who do have a following, and they're, they're going to sell a certain number of books to the fans of that particular celebrity. But they won't even take you on unless you can demonstrate that you are out there and you're selling books yourself. So the way to go is self-publishing. What are the steps? Well, first of all, it's much, much easier today. It's far easier. It's much faster. And the reason is the computer and the Internet. You can do all your research right at home. You've got access to the world's largest library. It's called the Internet. You don't have to drive downtown to the library. And if you do, you'll find the library doesn't have what you want anyway. So all of the research can be done there. You can contact people through forums, uh, listservs. To get more information, a listserv is the um, the cheapest consulting you can buy because it's free, and you can ask any question, and all these wonderful people will answer you. And I'm talking about forums on your particular subject. So for me, it would be on uh, books or it would be on parachutes because those are my two areas. And then uh, after a while, you can, you, you're doing research on your book and you're focusing your message and you're thinking about your reader. And after a while, you can start answering questions on these uh, forums, these listservs, and you always sign your entry with your name, your coming book title, and your URL. You want to drive eyeballs back to your website. Now, when your book comes out, you have a whole bunch of people out there on your subject who know you, like you, 
and want to buy your book. So you're going to do your research online, and you're also going to sell your books right back to those people online. I have a book, the title is Writing Nonfiction. It shows you step-by-step how to take your idea and take it all the way through until it's ready to publish, publish yourself, or send off to an agent and a publisher. So the first step is the research part. Then you do your rough draft. You take all your material and just roughly get it into the computer and put it into a binder so you can carry it around. Then you go through your second draft, which is your content edit, where you clean it up. And the third draft is where you take each chapter and you send it out to at least four experts on that chapter, people you don't even know. And then you get feedback from them. I'll tell you, 10% of your really good up-to-date stuff comes from other people because you prompted them to read your 15-page chapter, and it gives them all ideas, and they start scratching things in the margin. Your last draft is the fourth draft. That's your copy edit. That's where you send it out to a picky English pro, somebody to English it up for you. We all use editors. I Well, we all should use editors. And then you're ready. You've got it ready to go. Good. So one question on that last point you made about sending it to an editor. How do you find a good editor? This is a very subjective world when it comes to writing. I mean, you know good writing when you see it. You know know bad writing when you see it. A lot of people say they're a writer, yet they couldn't compose two sentences together and have it be grammatically correct. How do you find an editor? Well, and we all use editors, and some people are, they know their subject, but they're not good writers, or maybe English is their second language. It doesn't matter. You get all the material down, somebody else will clean it up. And even great writers use editors. Where do you find them? Well, on my website, in the supplier section, I've got a list of about 12 or 15 of them. You need to call up most of them, and the questions you ask is, what what do they charge? When can they fit it into their schedule? And the most important thing, have you ever worked on a book in this category before? You want to find somebody who likes the subject. Uh, somebody who's excited about it, and uh, somebody who can what bring ideas from previous works. You know, Jason, have you ever thought about this? And I read about this somewhere. Have you ever thought about that? And that's so they're not just doing uh, punctuation, and grammar, and style, but they're doing a little bit of um, content and giving you feedback as well. I know that people tend to kind of buy things by the pound sometimes. Is there any feedback on the optimal size of a book? And by the way, before you answer that, I want to say thank you for writing and sending me this short book, Self-Publishing Manual Volume 2, because I think a lot of books are a lot longer than they really need to be. What do you think about size? First of all, you, you need to go to a bookstore, go over to that shelf where your book is going to be, and uh, look at the books that are that will be right next to yours. You will find that books in different sections, different categories in the bookstore have a different look and feel and format and layout. For example, maybe all the books there are five and a half, eight and a half. Well, don't make your book eight and a half by 11. It's not going to fit on the shelf. You're going to find out if the majority of them are hardcover or are they softcover. Respect the category. Make your book look like it belongs there. It's what people who are buying that kind of book are used to. If you came out with a computer book in hardcover, it would stand out as being kind of weird because They're all nobody, cover, nobody yeah. needs a computer book that's going to last a long time. Right. Well, that's true. Yeah, it shouldn't last longer than the computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which isn't very long. So you'll find that cookbooks tend to be wider than they are tall, so they're open and lay flat on the counter. Many travel books are tall and skinny, have rounded corners, or on very lightweight paper so they can be slipped into a pocket or a pack. You want to respect the category, so definitely go there. Now, what about the length of the book? Because that's what I think... How many pages, yeah. How right. many pages? Well, you want a, you want a number? 144. Now, the reason for that... <laughs> 144, that okay. On many, many presses, um, I'm talking about book printing presses, they run a big sheet of paper through, and they print 24 up and 24 down. That's a 48-page total. And then it's folded into what we call a signature. So we have to look at increments of 48. 48 would be a skinny book. 96 pages was just not across that magic 100 number. It's hard to charge a full price for a 96-page book. So the next increment would be 144. All my books for several years have been 144 pages, including that one that you just mentioned, Volume 2 of Self-Publishing Manual. I, I just looked at the last page. It's 144. <laughs> and that's, that's for all the printed pages. I mean, that's all of your front matter, your text, and your back matter. So that's very efficient. Now, if you want to add half of that, 24 pages, uh, that can be done. But the most efficient, paper is the most expensive part of the book. Press runs are not inexpensive. And so the really the most economical size is 144. 
Saying that, though, Dan, it's kind of interesting because what if your idea is more than 144 pages, or what if it's less than that? I mean, how do you really make it fit? Well, most people want to know what happens if it's less than that. Well, you're, you've got about 10 pages of front matter to start with. I mean, you've got your testimonials, your, your endorsements, title page, your, title yeah, page, right, your yeah. copyright page, your table of contents, uh, your acknowledgments, your something about the author, your foreword. I mean, you could, you could have 10, 12, 13 pages right there. In the back of your book, you definitely want to have a, an appendix, which would include your index. You must have an index. I mean, it's, people want that, and libraries want it, and bookstores want it. How, how do you do indexing? I've heard that libraries and academia will not take a book without an index. Any, That's right. Any well, recommendations you can do an index on how to yourself do it? very, very quickly. There are indexing programs, but they've. It's Boy, they're a lot of work. They don't really work, do they? No. You know your book because you wrote it. All you have to do is uh, right there in Microsoft Word, you start skimming your own book, and you start typing in words and page numbers, and you sort it, auto-sort it, and you keep on writing or, or you know, reading and adding more words and page numbers and auto-sorting it. And you can do that 144-page book. For me, it would take less than an hour. For somebody the first time, it would certainly be no more than an hour and a half. To do the index, you mean? Now, if you get somebody else to do it, they don't know the book. They have to read it very carefully, but you know where everything is. Speaking of which, you said something that I just wanted to bring up because I know a lot of speakers are kind of busy, they're traveling, they're trying to get more gigs and book more engagements, and they just want to hire a ghostwriter to write on the topic. Talk to everybody about ghostwriters for a moment, if you would. Bad idea? That's perfectly okay. You have the content. But maybe you don't have the time to do the writing. I mean, you don't think Lee Iacocca wrote those two bestsellers by himself, do you? Yeah, and I don't think Donald Trump writes any of his. Well, and these celebrity books are very rarely written by the celebrity. I mean, they, they, it's, it's just another product with their brand name on it. I have ghostwriters listed on my website in the supplier section. You hire them the same way you do an editor. How much do you charge? When could you fit it in your schedule? And have you ever worked on my subject before? If you have a business book, you don't want to give it to somebody who thinks that business is crass and commercial. You know, you want to give it to somebody who's done other business books and just loves business. Somebody's going to wake up at four in the morning so excited he or she can't wait to work on it. Now, the more you give them, the better. And you can go through my writing nonfiction book, and it shows you how to gather your material and lay it out in piles, one pile for each chapter. Again, the more you can give them, the better. You could just give them transcriptions of your speeches and give them something very general and let them go with that. It's going to take them a little bit longer, and they'll have to do a little more organization. But there's nothing wrong with turning something over to a writer. I often say, um, do you like to do bookkeeping? I say, and what do you do with your bookkeeping? I hire it out. Well, with your writing, you can hire it out. It's the same thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And you brought up uh, professional speakers. Now, you know, generally speaking, professional speakers tend to be more gregarious, more outgoing, and more extroverted than writers like me. I'm an introverted writer. So on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, writers tend to be a 3 or a 4. And many of the professional speakers are up around 7 and 8. Salespeople tend to be 9s and 10s. So I always have to ask people who they are, what's this book about, where do you want to go with it, and I try to determine... Uh, where they are on that scale 1 to 10. And if they're terribly extroverted, then I give them permission to get help. Uh, hire a writer. You don't have to do that. Do what you do best and hire out the things that you don't want to do. Since we're on that subject, i got to just ask you a couple questions about it. I, people have asked me this question. They've said, I found some ghostwriters online, but they won't tell me what they've written because it's confidential. They might have a confidentiality agreement with the author, in quotes, <laughs> who hired them. And they, they can't say, and there's nothing on the book that says who actually wrote it a lot of times. So how do you know if they're any good? Well, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. So sometimes it is confidential. They are ghosts. They're not supposed to be. Exactly, names. by definition. But that's why I say you want to ask if they've worked on your category of book before. And, I mean, if they can't tell you, they're not going to tell you. But I'd spend a little more time on the phone and ask them how many books they've done, how have the books done, uh, how have the books sold. And if they didn't sell, why didn't they sell? Because the publisher didn't do any promotion. And I'd, I'd, I'd chat them up. I mean, you've you got to make sure you like the person because you're, you're getting married for a short period of time. One last question about the ghostwriter. How much should someone expect to pay for hiring a ghost? Well, it's all over the block. And the ones that are more successful charge a lot more money. And um, I can't give you a specific figure. I'd say it's 5000 to $50,000. Of course, it depends on what they charge for. 
the first ghost that worked with uh, Lee Iacocca, and the names are on the cover in that case, by the way, he wasn't sure the book was going to go anywhere, so he wanted to get paid outright, and I'm not sure how much he was paid. Maybe he was... 30 grand or 50 grand or something. Well, the book took off like a homesick angel. <laughs> Bad decision. And the second ghostwriter, he wanted a piece of the action. Now, if this is your first book or you're not a celebrity like Iacocca, it's not likely you'll get a ghostwriter to uh, work on your book. What, on spec for a piece of the action? They want to get paid outright. But there are two ways to go. What about design, Dan? There's two aspects to design. There's the cover design, obviously. Then there's the interior design, the layout of the book. Do you hire someone to do that? Do you do it yourself? Any suggestions on formatting? You talked about formatting before. Yes, you do hire somebody. The typesetter is also the designer. But you have to give them guidance because nobody knows your subject as well as you do. Nobody knows your audience as well as you do. So you go to a bookstore and you look on that shelf where your book is going to be and you find a book that you really like. I mean, you like the size, you like the color of the paper, you like the type style, you like the way the chapters start off. It just makes you feel good. I mean, you just, you'd like your book to look like that book. Buy that book, that's your model. You're going to take that to your type you're going to take it to the printer and you're going to say, I want my book to look like this. They'll make a few adjustments and so on, but you're giving them the guidance. As I say, nobody knows your audience as well as you do. You know what they want, what they'll accept. And somebody has spent a lot of time and money designing that book so you can just adapt the design. Is there any, like, software that you want to recommend to the listeners other than just typical, word, you know, Microsoft Word? Uh, anything that helps you come up with ideas? Anything that... Uh, I know they have this for fiction. They have all kinds of software programs for screenwriters and novelists and things like that. And then anything on maybe design, if you want to do the design yourself. Well, no, we use Microsoft Word, and I do my books, and I've, I've done this since 1981 when I got my first computer, I do my books in what I call page layout format. So in the middle of your 8.5 by 11 sheet, you've got a column that's about four and a quarter wide or about seven long. And by the way, in my writing nonfiction book, it says go to page setup and put in these numbers, and then your page will come out just right. But anyway, so then you can can import your pictures, put in your captions, uh, change the typeface for your quotations and things like that. You can see exactly what your reader is going to see. Then when you take it to your typesetter, it's already trial typeset, and you know that you have exactly how many pages you have. And then you can adjust the type size and the type style a little bit to make sure you come out with 144. Now, you also talked about uh, where do you get ideas. The most important thing to do is sufficient research before you write one word. One thing that you do is you get Document 116 for my website, which is free, which shows you how to lay out your back cover sales copy. It's paint by the numbers. It's also in my several of my books, Document 116. Do the research. This is a great story. About three months ago, I was speaking in Durban, South Africa. A week later, I spoke in Johannesburg. Guy came up to me at the Johannesburg one. He says, I was in your class last week in Turban, and boy, that idea about Amazon, that was fabulous. I said, what happened? He said, well, you told me to go and look for books as close to mine as possible. And I did that, and then I started reading the reviews. It was fascinating. I found out what people want and what they don't want. I found what they like and what they don't like. I found out what to put in my book and what to leave out. You can't do too much research. Find as, uh, you know, get as much information as possible. And this is motivating. And then you print out a lot of that stuff and a lot of those ideas you're going to put into your book. Good advice. Let's maybe switch gears to the area of promotion here, Dan. That's a huge topic, obviously, and we don't have time to cover it now. But what are the basics of book promotion? First of all, all your promotion is going to be done online. Do not pay for advertising in any respect or in any media. But most of your promotion is going to be done online because eyeballs have moved from print to online. Forget magazines, forget newspapers. Don't send review copies to them. It's not worth it. All of that will be done online. And it's very inexpensive, very cheap today. You're going to spend some more time uh, contacting people online. Spend more time online, not less. I'm not talking about frivolous time. But you've got to do several things a day for your book. And that might be, you know, emails and uh, a blog posting, a posting at a forum, a contribution to a website, posting articles. But do at least five of these a day, and promotion takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. But it's so easy today to get the word out on your subject 
if you do it online. It's all computerized. It's all Internet. It's all fast, easy, and cheap. What do you think about things like radio, TV, interview report, and these, you say no advertising, but they, they really cater to these small self-published authors. They're trying to get their business for getting interviews and so forth to promote their book. And what do you think about radio promotion and things like that in general? Well, well two things. Uh, if, if you like to do radio, the only way to get on radio or television is with a book. When anybody's being interviewed, 95% of them have a book. They might be a celebrity, they might be an unknown, but toward the end of the interview, up comes the book. So if you want to do those, you've got to have a book to get on. Now, here's an interesting concept. People who read respond to print. People who listen respond to audio. People who are visual respond to video. So I don't really feel that YouTube is a good place to promote your book because one is visual and the other is print. You can do things in blogs to promote your book because they're both print. You have different kinds of people. You have people who are at home a lot and they love printed books. You have people who are behind the wheel. They're sales reps. They're long-haul truckers. They're long-distance commuters. They listen to audio because they're driving. They can't read a book. I travel. I fly more than 6,000 miles every week. I'm all over the world. I'm out of the country 40% of the time. For years and years, I've been reading e-books. I read a lot of historical fiction. I love reading e-books. I can't carry books with me. Sometimes I'll download an audio an audio book and, and put it into my iPhone, but mostly I'm reading print. And I love to go to a place where I have to stand in line for a few minutes because I just whip out my iPhone and continue reading. It's a gift. So you have to realize that there are different kinds of people. And e-books don't replace uh, print books and audio books don't replace something else. They're going to a different segment of the population. That being said, if your book is not available as a print book, an e-book, an audio book, then for any promotion that you do, you're going to miss some sales because some of those people just can't consume it. Any tricks on in terms of like wh- where should they get their book printed? I mean, I know you the P book is a very important element. Do you just go to your local printer? Short run is a thing that in the past ten years really evolved. I mean, you can you can print one book now. You can print ten books. What's the perfect print quantity? Well, you've got three uh, segments there. You've got your print on demand, which is one book at a time. Uh, There are times when you want to do that, but it's really expensive. Printing's a quantity game. The more you print, the lower the pre-unit cost. Up to about 2,500 copies, you deal with a digital printer. There are 24 of them across the U.S. or across North America. Over 2,500, you use a standard offset printer, and there are 42 of them across North America. Now, any printer can print your book, but you want to deal with a book printer. You're going to get price, service, and quality out of a book printer. That's all they do is one book behind another, true gang printing. They're going seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The glue doesn't cool down. Paper is the most expensive part of a printed book. And so these people are buying their paper by the multi-carloads, and they're only stocking five or six different types. If you go down to the local printer, any printer can do your book, but he's going to get in one pallet of paper, and he's going to pay two to three times as much, and that has to be passed on to you. And then uh, he really doesn't know how to do books because he doesn't do them very often. He likes them because they're a high-ticket item, but maybe your pages don't come out in the right order. It's just not worth fooling around. Uh, you want to deal with a specialist. So I assume you're going to say there's a resource for that on parapub.com, right? Well, all the printers are, are listed in the back of my books. That, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, and then I've, I've got some reports on it, and I've got their email addresses, so it's easy to send out the request for quotations. And, oh, and which is the best printer? The lowest bidder. You use my list, you take the lowest bidder. Everyone is set up a little bit differently. I mean, out of those um, 42 hardcover, uh, 42 offset printers, there's probably only six or seven that do hardcover. And so that's why you have to send out the RFQ to all of them and see what they do. By the way, you you also wanted to ask about e-books. Sure. Uh, E-books are the wave of the future, but they're not for everybody. Some people want audio, some people want print. They're not going to replace the print book. But... E-books are very exciting. The sales are absolutely skyrocketing. And the best way to get your book into the e-book is to upload it to smashwords.com, S-M-A-S-H-words.com. They will put it into nine different formats, PDF, LIT, Moby Pocket Palm, EPUB, Sony, Kindle, and so on. No charge. They put it up at their website. When they sell one, they send you 85%. They keep 15%. So you're paying for performance. They've also made deals with Amazon, Apple, uh, Sony, BarnesandNoble.com, Google, and so on. Now, there you have to give away a little more. But you have got the whole e-book market completely covered. And when I came out with that 
self-publishing manual volume two. I finished at six o'clock at night. It took me 20 minutes, I think, to upload it to Smashwords and three more weeks to have it printed. So the ebook came out first. Then later on, if you decide that you want to deal directly with Amazon or you want to do something, you can opt out. But initially, uh, you just can't beat this. The price is right, free, and it happens just immediately. You're, you're up online in about an hour. So they'll take care of your content creation in terms of formatting. Yeah, well, they have a style guide and there's something. For example, you have to take the, the numbers out of your table of contents because the pages will be different. And you have to delete your index because people will use a, a word search to find what they want. But there's certain things that you have to do to make it compatible so that their meat grinder can turn it into these nine different formats. One, one of the problems with the, the e-book or the, the digital version is, is the images, tables, pictures, illustrations. I find those are somewhat problematic on my own Kindle, I'll tell you that much. Well, sure, and you've got a choice. You'll just check off the box and say, you know, I'm not going to check off Kindle because uh, I have color photos, but I want it in EPUB and I want it in PDF, and, and you go down the list like that. It's very exciting, the, uh, the new Apple iPad. Boy, I've seen a lot of those on the airplanes lately. You know, they are revolutionizing the comic book industry because they're large format and they're four color. Next will be the children's books and maybe coffee table books downstream. There'll be some of those. But it's going to just absolutely revolutionize the comic book industry because of the large format and the four color. Let's go back to the old traditional book publishing industry. For a self-publisher, Dan, if you just want to, if you think it'll be a good thing for your promotion, for your bottom line, can you get your books in the bookstore as a self-published guy? Or is that are you locked out from that unless you have a publisher? Well, absolutely. 78% of all the books published are self-published. The big publishers only do 22%. Everybody down the line, whether it's a distributor, a wholesaler, a bookstore, another publisher, they want books that are going to sell. Nobody cares who the publisher is. When people buy nonfiction for one or two reasons, to learn something or solve a problem, they go into a bookstore and they see your book on the shelf and they're asking themselves, is this book going to answer my question? Uh, they might look at the uh, about the author page, the biography, to see if you're a credible person. Nobody ever looks to see who the publisher is. People, the buyer doesn't know one publisher from another. It's just not an issue. But how do you get in? Do you just walk into Barnes & Noble and say, hey, will you carry my book? Or? Yeah, there are two ways. Uh, the, the best way is to uh, go with a distributor. There are uh, 90 distributors, and some are very specialized, only computer books, only children's books. Some are more general, and they uh, focus on uh, six or eight or ten different categories. You know, again, they're listed in my book. They're listed on my website. And you want to go to their websites and kind of check them out and see uh, how many books they have on your subject. This is important because they have sales reps that go out and visit the stores. Now, business books tend to be sold in downtown stores. Books on parenting and relationships tend to be sold out in the malls. So if you have a, a book on parenting, uh, you don't want to go with a distributor that only goes to the downtown stores. I mean, they're not even going to carry your book along. And it's just a bad match. You want to be matched as closely as possible. They're constantly looking for more product. And one of the most important things, Jason, is that they want to make sure that you're going to promote the book. They don't want to say, well, sure, we'll get into the stores, but what are you going to do to get customers into the stores? And this means spending time online, letting people know that you have a book and what it covers and it's available. I mean, it's not a big deal. <laughs> But you have to get out there and promote the book. Yeah, absolutely. So, Dan, let's just close with measuring. I find that in life in general, and I'm certain it's true in the book publishing industry as well, some people are kind of winning the game sometimes, yet they're not satisfied with the results because they just don't know how to keep score. I wanted maybe you to share some metrics on what one might consider as a successful self-publisher? How does someone know when they've, they've done a great job of it or, or, or they need to do more? Or, or There's a million points in between. I understand that. Well, the, the most important measurement is are you making money doing this? And I will tell you, I've written 126 books. I have never lost money on a book. Now, a number of years ago, I wrote the right book at the right time. Sales took off like a homesick angel, and it allowed me to move back to California and buy this house on a hill overlooking the ocean. Um, now, I'm not going to tell you that if you write a book, you can buy a house with an ocean view, but I've never lost money on a book. And the, your book is passive income. It's earning money for you when you're working, when you're not working, it's even earning for you when you're sleeping. One of the reasons I can spend so much time away from home traveling and speaking is because I have these books that are just earning for me. My, I put my children to work. Now, 
another measure are the wonderful letters you get from people all over the world thanking you for your your book, your research, your insight uh, for helping them and so many people. You know, a book is a very inexpensive way to distribute what you know. Many of the of your listeners are consultants, and you know, a consultant can only talk to a couple of people at one time. Many of them are speakers, and you can only speak to a room full. But your book goes all over the world, and it helps people individually on their schedule. It also brings back more credibility to you, and it brings in more speaking business, more consulting business. I mean, people want to deal with the expert, and by definition, the expert's the one that's, that, who wrote the book. So your book becomes your new business card. So we, we, we can measure our success by the amount of money it's bringing in, the amount of business it's bringing in, and the wonderful letters that we get. Anything on numbers, though, like the average published book, does it sell 5,000 copies or 20,000 copies if it's with a big publisher? And then yeah, the average numbers are terrible. I mean, the average number is 8,500. And you've heard of Harry Potter and some of these other sure. bestsellers. Yeah, obviously, there's many books that are selling far fewer. And we also mentioned the vanity presses earlier. If you use the numbers that they publish and you divide the, the number of titles into the number of books they've sold, they sell less than 100 copies per title. And most of those they sell to the author. So that's another reason not to go that direction. It's selling 8,500 copies, I don't think it's very good. And one of the reasons that the big New York publishers don't sell more than that is they are very reluctant. They hardly ever revise a book because then they'd have to start over. And for a professional person, for a professional speaker, for a consultant, our book is the same as our business. And we're constantly improving it. We're constantly collecting information. Every time we go back to press, we make some changes to it. You know, my self-publishing manual is in the 16th revised edition, the 22nd printing in 32 years. Wow. <laughs> it's constantly growing, constantly changing, constantly getting better. And you'll find that the same people who bought the earlier one are now buying your current one mm -hmm. because they know you, like you, and they want the latest information. They're the best customers. So your book is always getting better. And you're going to sell, you're not going to sell 8,500 copies. You're going to sell so many a year, year after year after year after year. Excellent. Well, Dan, this has been very, very interesting talking to you. I've been such a fan of your work for so many years now that it's just great to talk to you in person finally and have you on the show as well. What would you like to say to just to sum it all up? In summary, the most expensive parts of publishing are the mistakes. You don't have to make them. You know, other people have already done it. It's a shame when somebody makes a mistake. It's unforgivable when it happens twice. So get out there, spend time online, talk to other people, go to conferences, listen to these radio programs, read the books. You don't have to make those mistakes. It's a lot cheaper to do these other things, and you'll find it's a heck of a lot of fun because you're working in your own subject area. Good stuff. Well, Dan Pointer, the self-publishing expert. The website is parapub.com. That's P-A-R-A-P-U-B.com. And Dan, I got to also thank you, not just for being on the show, but your website is a wealth of information. It's phenomenal. So thank <laughs> you for your contribution to the industry and, and for joining us today. Well, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Jason. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about some cool new investor software, there's a show for that. If you want to learn why Rome fell, Hitler rose, and Enron failed, there's a show for that. If you want to know about property evaluation technology on the iPhone, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know how to make millions with mobile homes, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything, only from jasonhartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.